the floor is open. So raise your hand. And uh, when you uh, make a question or a comment, please be brief. And uh, before you ask uh, you know, questions or comments, please uh, identify yourself. Uh, and uh, uh, please uh, let them know, you know, uh, where <laughs> your questions are, you know, directed to. So, any any questions? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Jenna Gibson. I'm at the University of Chicago, a PhD student. Um, my question is actually for Dr. Kim. Um, so you. I find it really interesting. Uh, I don't study education at all, but I'm really interested in your work. And one thing that I've been thinking about a lot being here in Korea for the summer um, is Songdo and the international schools that have been built out there in the last few years. Um, from my understanding, and please you know, correct me if I'm wrong, part of the motivation was to encourage more foreign students to study abroad in Korea. But from what I understand, it maybe hasn't worked exactly as they planned, or maybe it's smaller than they wanted it to eventually be. So I'm, I'm curious what um, if you've done any research on that specifically. Okay, uh, I will collect uh, you know some questions. Uh, yes, Taylor. Uh, hello, my name is Taylor. I'm a graduate student at GSIS. And this is for Dr. Katz. I was just wondering what role you see China playing in the current uh, Japan-Korea issues, if they're going to be a responsible stakeholder in the region and try to like downplay it or, or soothe the tensions, or if they're going to try to exploit the tensions between these two U.S. allies. Thank you. Interesting. Role of China, <laughs> not U.S. Hyungjun. Hi, I'm Hyungjun from the University of Chicago. I have a question for Professor Ko. It's always a pleasure to hear about your ongoing research. So uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, so your, your research essentially proposes a conditional hypothesis wherein nationalism becomes a force for conflict only to the extent that leaders believe in the probability of complete or decisive victory. For me, an interesting obverse of this hypothesis is that low-level conflicts might be more likely when nationalist agitation is at lower levels uh, because the public is then more willing to accept partial or uh, you know, a piecemeal uh, victories or gains. Um, so can, can you say a few words about um, whether you see such dynamics in your research, in your in empirical investigations? Uh, one interesting counterintuitive policy implication of this is that actually leaders who are interested in managing escalation, de-escalation, who are interested in peace, might actually have an interest under some circumstances in, in actually styming, like bolstering nationalism, right? Um, is that uh, too much of a stretch of an inference to draw from your uh, research? Or um, do you see actually some of these dynamics at work um, in your empirical investigations? Thank you. Thank you. I, I will take uh, one more question for the first round. Yes. Microphone. <laughs> oh. Oh, I actually, uh, I'm a master's student at KUGSIS, and I have a question for Dr. Young. Uh, my question was, uh, what kind of relations and like how strong the relations between third world countries and the North Korea have? And if the relations are like strong enough, as you said, is it gonna influence the effectiveness of, of the sanctions against North Korea? And if that's the case, will there be any chance that North Korea just kind of uh, abandons its efforts to build a peaceful relations with South Korea and the U.S. and just focus on its relations, uh, like its economic or diplomatic or cultural relations with third world countries? Okay, so uh, I will give the floor to Stephanie Kim first and then Katz, Ko, and Young. Thank you so much for your question. It's actually a, a really great question, and I'm glad you asked. So, um, so you're right. The the rationale of building a a, a place like Songdo was uh, to provide an infrastructure to accommodate international students. And so, uh, you know, the, the rationale is if you build it, they will come. And it was also it was happening alongside various government policies like the Study Korea project, 
with the goal of getting international students studying in South Korea up to 200,000. Um, so in terms of building up the international infrastructure, there were the English, camp English language campus settings, more EMI classes. Um, in many cases, some of these schools have, you know, quote unquote, imported foreign scholars from overseas to teach in English at these campuses. And you know, I, I've written in my work that while it does attract international students to South Korea, what it also does in conjunction is re-attract Korean students who might already be overseas or who might otherwise go overseas from a domestic market. And I've called this phenomenon reverse student mobility. I, I've published a paper on it and I'm happy to share it with you. And in this sense, it forces us to think of internationalization efforts in higher education as counterintuitively anti-internationalization because it effectively retains or reverses the flow of students across national borders if that's how we define internationalization in higher education traditionally. So, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Katz? Um, yeah, thank you for bringing up the role of China. I think it's a really interesting and important part of this. Um, I, I'm not sure if this was your question, but I, I certainly don't think China is going to try to reconcile Japan and South Korea, primarily because strategically it really likes it when Japan and South Korea fight. Uh, seeing uh, you know U.S. allies, uh, you know the the other uh, third part of the triangle not working out is quite good strategically for China as well as North Korea. Um, in this case, they also might benefit economically. You know, further on down the line, there's speculation that China could be a new supplier for the um, products that. South Korea would no longer be getting from Japan. So it's a double double whammy effect of not really helping things uh, in terms of reconciliation. Uh, interestingly, though, also right now, um, Prime Minister Abe and, and um, Xi Jinping are in a warm, more warm phase than in the past. So that would also complicate, I guess, uh, I mean, not complicate, but th th they seem to be um, doing quite well at sitting back right now. Um, historically, it's, it's, it's not been constant like that, though. I mean, gen generally, South Korea and China have been on the same side of the history issues. So we've seen times in the past when, um, like Park pa Geun Hye's time, for instance, when um, China was also fighting with Japan over the same historical issues. So there's variation there, but generally, I, I think they would never wouldn't see, in, at least in you know our current world, uh, uh, a role to actually ease tensions because it can be quite good for them. So. Thank you, Dr. Ko. Um, thank you for a really interesting question. I guess like the uh, India-Pakistan diet may be like the one that shows like high nationalism can be correlated with like frequent like low level of conflicts. But I think even in the case, I mean, if you look at, I mean, those cases, usually these crises are driven by like private actors or like um, like a military level initiative, not at the like leader level. So if leaders believe that there is no, I mean, high chance of like winning in a war, then um, they still, it's um, better for them to avoid like low level conflicts. Um, so, because there is like still like a chance of escalation and then it is more costly for leaders to, um, cool down popular nationalism once like low level like uh, disputes um, take place. Um, so I think like at their will, like leaders are still likely to, I mean, play, a I mean, leaders, um, even if leaders want to play a nationalism card, still it's very likely that um, they want to avoid uh, even low level disputes um, if they are not confident about the chance of winning. Okay, Young? Um, so in regards to how North Korea treats the third world now, it's, it's been a substantial shift. I think there's two key events that kind of signal that is that um, a few years ago, North Korean hackers stole uh, over $100 million from the Central, Central Bank of Bangladesh, and they specifically targeted Bangladesh because their security measures are weaker than a lot of developed countries. And uh, I think it was like two years ago when North Korea, North Korean agents uh, helped to plan an attack on uh, 
Kim Jong Nam in Malaysia's international airport with a WMD grade nerve agent. You you don't do these two events to countries that you see as allies. Um, so North Korea, they still have rhetoric that talks about uh, solidarity with anti-imperialist countries, uh, but there's really only a, a few that they still regard as allies. One is uh, Cuba. Cuba and North Korea relations are still very strong. Venezuela. Um, and also a couple regimes in, in Africa. But overall, I think North Korea now thinks of the third world as, as an opportunity to undermine uh, political rivals, whether it's South Korea or whether it's uh, internal enemies that are a threat to the ruling elite. And this shift actually began under, uh, really began under Kim Jong-il with the bombing in 1983 in uh, Burma. Uh, Kim Jong Il really he re he reversed what Kim Il Sung's kind of Kim Il Sung had a revolution revolutionary duty to help out uh, third world movements and third world governments, but under Kim Jong Il and now Kim Jong Un, it's it's sub sub substantially different. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, second round, briefly. Uh, are there any uh, undergraduate students? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Privilege. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's an honor to um, yeah pose a question, and I have a question for uh, Dr. Young, and oh, um, I'm um, majoring in cultural tourism, so I do not know like nearly any of about this field. But what what made me interested was that you like mentioned a mass game as a cult like cultural diplomacy. So I would like to know like how North Korea is. Um, doing some cultural diplomacy towards um, some African countries, which are kind of corrupted, or like the third world you mentioned. Okay, you. any others? Yes. Uh, my name is Young Jae. I'm in the uh, master's program at the political science department here at Korea University. Uh, my question is to Dr. Ko. So you mentioned the part about um, the cooling down effect of nationalism and how regimes, especially in authoritarian regimes, they actually use methods such as media control, which got me thinking to maybe like China and Japan in the early 2000s when there was the uh, arson of the embassy. But in 2019, I was thinking, is this like mechanism like uh, effective? So I was wondering how, what your thoughts would be on the effectiveness of this media control to cool down nationalism and if it does really work as a cool down mechanism. Okay. Any, any questions on the other side? Yes. Nice to meet you. I'm Jun Kim. I'm in the master degrees course at GSIS. I want to ask Professor Cha. Uh, I read the Impossible State in Prasili and read the article that Professor mentioned that the talks in Panmunjom is kind of reality show. Well, I think it is a problem that the summit couldn't make any progress and has repeated certain pattern until now. In my humble opinion, it, com it comes from a disagreement of needs. What the North Korea really wants is the survival of leaders, honestly. Um, but the United States can give is just economic assurance. Yeah, so. Uh, so please let me know what you think. It could be ha very helpful for my thesis proposal. <laughs> okay. Is there anybody who cannot uh, go to sleep uh, without making any questions? Yes. Uh, hello, I'm also a student here at KU GSIS. Um, I have, maybe my question is directed to Dr. Katz. Um, so, Security Council sanctions have been there since maybe uh, North Korea's first nuclear test in 2006, but I guess recent, uh, recent sanctions um, restricting North Korean exports of coal and imports of oil had uh, more effect on North Korean economy and the regime itself. Um, <coughs> and also China's participation in the sanctions regime. So um, I want to hear your opinion on what the motivations of China's participation in the sanctions regime may be, and to what degree, up to what degree China will participate in the regime as well. Okay. In the rear seat? Yes. No, no, no. 
you raise your hand, right? Uh, he, he raised it. <laughs> but you gave up? You passed? No, no, no. Uh, we both raised it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, first come, first serve. Uh, hello, um, I have a question for Dr. Kim. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at Stanford, um, and as a student studying abroad, um, international student studying abroad, um, I had a question of, um, so you mentioned how the um, institutions are using uh, international students paid tuition to cover for their budget, but I'm also interested in how the United States promotes their soft power through um, high elite education, because I think that um, the United States is unparalleled um, in promoting sort of um, an, a high ed elite education by attracting students from around the globe. So I'm interested in how that sort of links to soft power. Okay, good question. Okay, next to him. Um, hi, uh, my name is Choi Hyun Bin. I'm an undergrad undergraduate student here in uh, Korea University. My question is, uh, if I may, I have two questions. Uh, one is directed to Dr. Katz and the other is directed to uh, Dr. Scott. Uh, for Dr. Katz, I was wondering if um, uh, by my understanding, um, I'm not an expert, but uh, from how from my studies, uh, the conflict patterns in Northeast Asia seems to be changing because uh, for uh, for uh, for the majority of the patterns, South Korea has been more on the more anti-Japan rhetoric, but then now Japan is also turning to anti-South Korea rhetoric. Uh, so um, I wonder uh, if that could be part of the patterns that are changing in Northeast Asia. And what what are your thoughts about it? And for Dr. Scott. Um, cybersecurity issues are becoming a very important aspect of interstate warfare, interstate, interstate conflict, and uh, I'm not sure if you, ha if if you uh, are an expert on the Korean side of things, but I want, I was wondering if you have any knowledge, if you could, ex if you could explain what you think about how ready South Korea is in the case of an all-scale, uh, hypothetically speaking, all um, very large-scale North Korean attack. Uh, on South Korean networks. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Dr. Young. All right, I'm gonna do this very briefly. Uh, thanks for your question. So North Korea, the, the mass games collaboration really ended in the mid 1990s. North Korea just simply ran out of money and they still don't really have a lot of money and um, they don't really wanna devote it too much to cultural diplomacy with, uh, with, for, with African countries. But they, what they do now is they set up Juche study institutions, Juche study groups in Africa and they use this for domestic propaganda purposes, just saying, oh, you know, our leaders are really uh, revered around the world, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it's very, uh, it's for all extensive purposes, it's pretty shallow and superficial. And sometimes they even just pay locals to come to their Juche study groups. Um, I found some evidence of that. So uh, right now, I mean, South Korea, it's, it's soft power is a million times greater than North Korea's. But I think there is still kind of this anti-colonial solidarity, solidarity with North Korea. It is still kind of in the background, but you can't compete with BTS. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Ko. Um, thank you for your question. Let me briefly illustrate like how um, the Chinese government used the media control in 2012. So, nationalist protests occurred like more than um, in more than 100 cities in China, but <laughs> Almost no Chinese newspapers um, posted like photos of protest. And before like popular nationalism was on the rise, um, the main um, Chinese um, state media covered the Diaoi Senkaku issue for like 40 hours per week. But after like nationalist protest started to uh, spread across the country, the Chinese government cut down the uh, media coverage to up, up to like five um, hours per week. So that dramatically like changed the um, people's attention. And also at the same time, the Chinese government increased to like think about more like a mature patriotism to their citizens through, through their media. So yeah, that's the way that uh, how the Chinese government controlled um, and then and it was trying to cool down, yeah, popular nationalism. Okay, Scott. Sure, um, in terms of large scale attacks, um, some of this is threat model that for almost anyone who has 
persistent access through to another country, you get much more value out of having the surveillance and view of it than you do shutting it down, um, right? If, especially if your motive here is profit, um, not just disruption. Um, so, so most people, when they're thinking about a large scale like disruption, uh, that happens much more from squirrels or animals than from a, a cyber attacker. Um, I think, you know, from what I've seen, South Korea is as prepared as anyone for for uh, major disruption attacks. Dr. Kim. So thank you for your question, and actually that's a very good point. And yes, um, th certainly there's a soft power element to this. And so uh, different from the institutional level, which is primarily about the bottom line, on, on a nation state level, it, in many respects it is about soft power. And so from the US side of it, there are programs to promote soft power via international education opportunities, uh, the most famous of them being the Fulbright program to bring in um, international students to the US and send US students uh, outward to countries. Um, you know, these programs are also very much dependent on the priorities of whatever administration is, is currently uh, holding court. And, and unfortunately, uh, in this current moment, that doesn't seem to be a, a very high priority at the moment. What I actually find quite interesting is that the soft power priority is also happening on the South Korean side. And so you see this through Korean studies uh, funding mechanisms like the Korea Foundation, uh, what is it, Hangul Kukje Kyoyuk Wiwandan, and the Academy of Korean Studies, the, the Chungang, uh, I, I forget the Korean um, uh, uh, name, Hangul Chungang Yongguwon, okay. Um, and, and so these are, I find very interesting because they fund the study of Korea primarily to overseas scholars and to overseas institutions. And in many respects, you can also look at that as a form of soft power uh, to, to taking place on the South Korean side. Okay, Dr. Kat, briefly. Okay, um, on the sanctions question, um, I mean, it's not directly related to my work, but it's something I've thought about. I think, you know, China, yes, was a very uh, a big supporter of the maximum pressure campaign, and that was very significant maximum pressure of course still exists in terms of sanctions but 2017 was the peak uh kind of cooperation phase for china uh i saw it's because their interest in stability that was the, the, the most the least stable time in terms of dynamics with north korea um it's it's enforcement of those sanctions is you know it's incentives to enforce them go down uh, maybe not um, doing it overtly but go down once uh, tensions have eased and the sta situation stabilized it's a very brief I guess response to that um, on the conflict patterns question that's a really uh, good insight and something that yeah d definitely it problematically does seem to be true um, and you know what it brings to mind is that the iterated patterns uh, don't repeat the exact same way every time. Over, it shows that over time, the you know things actually do change in, internally. And, and in Japan, I think there there has been, um, as you noted, increase in anti-South Korea sentiment over time because of the very repetition of of many of these same disputes. Um, what I what my way of thinking about that though is that I don't see it as a particular driver of the um, current dynamics. Um, it's important, but um, my sense is that there's still like, more of a relative ambivalence on the Japanese side about this issue um, compared to South Korea, and that if that were the only change, we wouldn't be seeing, you know, this blurring of, uh, you know, broader, you know, the uh, hot economics called politics. To me, the, dr the bigger driver of that change really has to do with the U.S. injecting uncertainty, strategic uncertainty into the region, as well as new tactics. I don't think Japan would have tried these tactics if the U.S. hadn't uh, kind of weaponized trade in its own way, so. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you know, I know, I know, but uh, together with your final word. Okay, before I give the floor to Victor, Professor Ishinoa, do you have any word uh, uh, as a senior advisor for this program? Well, I thought well, within, within 30 seconds. I said, old professor have no chance to talk today. <laughs> but I think I will see you guys in the dinner, and I have uh, several comments and questions, so why don't I save it so that you give a chance to tell. Okay, Victor. <clears throat> First, just to answer the question quickly, um, uh, Impossible State is a great book I heard. Yeah. Um, in terms of the question of security guarantees, I mean, as you know well, there are 
you can look at security guarantees as external security guarantees, which the United States has given many times to North Korea. Um, <clears throat> the most recent iteration on, on, on paper was the one that George W. Bush gave, which is that the United States will not attack North Korea with nuclear or conventional weapons, right? A negative security assurance. Um, but that's not the security guarantee that the regime wants. They want the internal security guarantee, and that, of course, is very difficult for any, any country to give. I think it would be interesting if someone did a study and looked at whether um, <clears throat> there's ever been a case in history where an autocratic leader accepted a security guarantee from a, from a, a security patron, an allied patron, and was satisfied with it. Because my guess is the answer is no, because of the nature of the regime itself. I mean, just think how democratic allies never feel comfortable even with a security guarantee from an ally, like South Korea and the United States. And, and this, is, this is a re relatively transparent relationship, so it's infinitely harder. The interesting thing about Donald Trump is that he seems to be trying to replace the notion of an internal security guarantee with the building of some sort of trust with the North Korean leader through these constant meetings and platitudes and things of that nature, which I find ironic because if there's anybody in the world that I would not trust, <laughs> this is all being filmed, if there's anybody in the world that I would not trust, it would be you know who. So, so with that, I, first I want to thank um, Professor Kim, uh, Professor Lee, and all of you for taking the time. Um, I thought it was an excellent discussion. Your questions were really excellent, really, um, um, all of you. And, and um, I, this was, to me at least, certainly the highlight we've had of the past uh, day and a half. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I think uh, we have had a very uh, interesting discussions. As we had expected, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have a really uh, exciting session. I personally believe uh, U.S.-Korea, Korea-U.S. relationship is like a human being uh, who needs to be regularly fed, uh, should be educated, and go to the hospital for regular checkup to live longer. Uh, I, in that sense, I'm pretty confident, you know, U.S., Korea, Korea, U.S. Uh, next-gen scholars uh, will contribute to uh, making this bilateral uh, alliance relationship uh, to uh, move to a, a better direction. So on that uh, optimistic note, uh, let me adjourn this session. I, I propose to give uh, these excellent, you know, uh, next-gen scholars a big round of applause.